Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first episode of The Skeleton Crew. We had so many episodes recorded, and all of them were wonderful, and our computers have conspired against us and destroyed them all. So we're starting our YouTube channel with this new series that we're provisionally calling This Week in Paleontology. If you have a better idea, put it in the comments, and we'll use it without attribution if we like it better than ours. I think we should introduce ourselves, because we've done this so many times now, and none of those videos have survived. So I'm James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at North Carolina State University and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where I study the ontogeny and systematics of theropod dinosaurs. Super cool. I'm very impressed that you resisted the urge to call yourself Dr. James Napoli. He knew um, you'd do it for him. Yeah. Hype man. Hi, I'm Alex Rubenstahl. I'm a graduate candidate at Yale University. Um, I study reptile palates, early crocodile and early theropod evolution, and... Uh, I'm on a lot of papers with James. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dalton Meyer. I'm a, uh, a PhD student also at Yale University. Um, I study the evolution of lizards. I'm looking at both the fossil record and um, some particular regions of the anatomy of extant lizards to try and, and figure out what it is about them that's leading us to have so many unresolved issues in their phylogeny. Speaking of <clears throat> lizards with un unresolved biology issues. Uh, my name is Amelia Zietler. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History working on mosasaurs, which um, are historically very tricky to place within squamata or lizards more generally. Um, so part of my research is trying to figure out um, where they go within lizards by looking at their anatomy, comparing it to the anatomy of living lizards. Um, yeah. All right. Now the scientists have introduced themselves, so let's move on. <laughs> I wish I had a fun, pithy segue that I could use to dovetail perfectly into my introduction, but alas. Uh, hi, I'm Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. You're probably wondering why there's a substantial cut between our introductions <laughs> and now. And you'll never and find out. If you yeah, support us, uh, people who support us by giving us $1,000 a month or more on Patreon. In perpetuity. In perpetuity. We'll get to see the cut. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get to see all the cut content. So the way that this series is going to go is that roughly weekly, on weeks that are busy for paleontology news, we're going to talk about papers that came out and what we think about them. Starting us off this week is going to be our good friend Dalton because he published a paper this week. Yay. And rather, Yay. So rather than have all of us tell Dalton what's wrong with the paper, we're going to let Dalton tell us what's wrong with the paper. Dalton, take it away. Well, what's wrong with the paper is nothing, because obviously I'm perfect and anything I contribute to is flawless. That's not the case, I'm sure. In the you should future, look at our apartment for evidence of this. <laughs> yes, don't look at all the trash that's behind me. Um, no, I wrote a paper with uh, my colleagues. It was led by an undergraduate uh, colleague of mine, Chase Brownstein, um, as well as former Yale student, Matteo Fabri, and then two professors here, uh, Andre Buller and my advisor, Jacques Godier. Uh, the paper is called The Evolutionary Origins of the Prolonged Extant Squamate Radiation. And in this paper, we describe two new species of lizard from the Morrison formation. So that's the, the famous Jurassic formation that gives us things like Allosaurus and Stegosaurus, um, and, you know, Ceratosaurus, all those, all those good stuff, tons of sauropods. Um, but here we describe two new lizards that are a part of the uh, broad lineage that includes modern skinks and girdled lizards and, and things of that nature. So yeah, one of these, one of these skulls is, is particularly well-preserved, three-dimensionally preserved, um, and, and decently complete, which is surprising for a Mesozoic lizard, especially one from the Jurassic. Uh, that's Eoskinkus ornatus. Um, which has most of the skull uh, preserved, except for you know parts of the brain case and a little bit of the front and the back. Uh, but we have a, a good lot of good material from that. And then our second species is Microteris borealis, uh, figure two in the paper. Um, that one's much uh, consists of some more scant material. So we have uh, two maxillae, so two of the bones of the upper jaw, and we have a brain case uh, that's associated with the specimen. Um, they both come from the Western US, which is where the Morrison's broadly exposed. Eoskinkus is a, a specimen from Dinosaur National Monument. And then Microteris is from Como Bluff, Wyoming, and is actually held here in the collections of the Peabody. 
Um, this is really kind of the first comment that's been done on the Peabody specimen. So Microterris has been just kind of sitting in the collection for, uh, you know, uh, tens of years before it's been worked on. Uh, Eoskinkus was described as a different species of lizard in the past. So back in 1990s by um, Susan Evans and Daniel Churi, um, they assigned it to a, a genus called Paramacelotus, which is a prehistoric skink relative from Europe and, and generally known some Jurassic remains, but mostly known from the early Cretaceous. And you know, it wasn't an unreasonable assignment at the time. Um, but we've re-examined these specimens now using CT data. So we have full 3D images of the specimen. You can see things that were previously hidden by the rock. You can see the undersides of bones, inside surfaces, things like that, that give us a lot more detail of the anatomy of this animal. Um, and we found by looking at it that um, it's pretty distinct from Paramacelotus. Um, distinct enough we suspected to, to warrant a new species um, and testing that in a phylogenetic framework. So actually like running an analysis and, and placing this thing on the lizard family tree, that suspicion proved to be correct. Um, and we ran a couple different analyses. We ran one um, under parsimony, which is essentially using the, the principle of whichever tree had the, le the least amount of evolution required to happen. Um, we, we did trees under that. And then we also used Bayesian methods, which takes probabilistic things into account uses a model of evolution and, um, and infers things like how much time and how much evolution took place over that amount of time uh, happened. And so under both of these different methods, we, we get essentially the same result, which is that these skinks are closely related to European taxa from the Cretaceous. Uh, so we tested this with another relative called Beclesius. Um, and we recover this group that is closely related to Paramacelotus. So it's called the Paramacelotidae um, and we get this really interesting little family of skinks that is, is in Europe and it's in North America, it's in the late, the late Jurassic, it's in the early Cretaceous, and it really gives us insight into the early evolution of skinks and more broadly into the early evolution of lizards as a whole. So it tells us a couple really interesting things about skinks, which is that their early evolution is, is more complex than we might have assumed. So looking at especially the palate of Eoskinkus, you see things that you wouldn't expect to see necessarily, like it has the very front bone of the palate is called the vomer and it has teeth on the vomer. And that's not something you see in most lizards. There's a few things today that have teeth on the vomer. Um, one of the, the glass lizards does, um, but it's really rare to see. Uh, but you see it in really ancient reptile groups ancestrally having teeth on the vomer. And, and right now, you know, it's, it's a bit ambiguous. Is this a retention of something old? Like, did it just hold on to these, these teeth that are then lost in other groups? or did it reacquire them? Um, either one's possible, but it shows that this the evolution of, of early skinks has a lot of surprises that you wouldn't expect given just modern skinks and what you look at. Now, the other interesting thing is that, so skinks, when, when looking at um, squamate evolutionary trees that are based on morphology, so that's not basing them on genetic data, um, but just looking at the morphology, kind of a classic group that has been recovered for a long time is this uh, relationship that skinks are really closely related to lacertoids. So that's things like wall lizards and tegus, um, things of that nature. And that group of lacertoids and skinks has been kind of canonical for, for a long time until the advent of molecules, which doesn't recover that group. Um, and our new fossils actually show that some of the features that would purportedly unite skinks and lacertoids are actually convergently acquired in both groups. Um, and so you see things like um, both groups modern in, in, in the modern, they lose teeth on their palatines and they reduce the length of a particular uh, fossa. So kind of an excavation on the palate. Um, but in Eoskinkus, you still see teeth on that element and you don't see a reduction in that fossa. And so it shows that if that was something that was shared between those two groups, you would expect all of the ancestral skinks essentially to have that morphology and you don't see it in, in Eoskinkus. And so it shows that some of the data that supports this group that we don't recover in molecules probably does really represent convergent evolution and, and not some kind of other weird signal. Um, and, and the other kind of big takeaway from our paper is that 
we, we where where we find Eoskinkus and Microteris in the Morrison formation, if you just look at the abundance of fossils, which is you know I'll be I'll be blunt is tricky to to use as an actual kind of proxy for how abundant these animals were, just because of how rare fossilization is. But given that um, all of the things we're looking at are kind of in the same size class and same morphology, they're kind of subject to the same taphonomic biases. So I think we're getting at least a decent window into kind of the relative abundance of animals. You find lizards and you find lizards like Eoskinkus and a few other things, but you find rhynchocephalians, which is another group of reptiles that's today only represented by the tuatara in New Zealand, but in the past was much, much more diverse. And at the onset of the Mesozoic, rhynchocephalians are much more diverse and much more abundant than lizards. And still in the late Jurassic, you get like tens of rhynchocephalians for any one lizard that you find. Mm -hmm. So the rhynchocephalians are still more abundant than the squamates, but it's no longer so clear that they're more diverse. It's looking like you're actually getting a diversity of squamates. They're starting to diversify into the groups that you see in the modern. So because we know we have skinks, we know we also at least must have geckos and we probably have early representative, representatives of other groups at the time, like iguanians and anguimorphs. And so squamates are starting to achieve their diversity, even though they're still kind of overshadowed, if you will, by their relatives, the rhynchocephalians. And so it, it's interesting that the kind of the rise of the squamates seems to be kind of a prolonged diversification without much abundance relative to what would be kind of ostensibly their primary competitors, um, the rhynchocephalians. And that pretty much is, sums up our paper uh, describing these two new lizards. It was uh, really exciting to work on it, really exciting to have it out finally for people to, to read and enjoy. It's open access. So, you know, there'll be a link in the description if you want to, to check it out. Uh, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and that's that's our paper. Cool. Thank you, Dom. Yeah. That's a really, really cool piece of research. So Thank you. one of my questions is, is there like, so the diversity of rhynchocephalians compared to squamates, that's mostly a taxonomic abundance thing as well, as, or rather, I know it's a, it's literal abundance. Like there are more <clears throat> rhynchocephalian yes. fossils than, than squamate fossils. Is that mirrored in the taxonomy and is that mirrored in ecomorphological diversity as well? So it is mirrored in the in, in taxonomic in, in taxonomy. You like at this time there are more at least recognized species of rhynchocephalians. Now that of course is is subject to bias in the fossil record, um, into probably a, a greater degree than the abundance because I think the abundance is going to be kind of equally affected by bias and preservation, whereas taxonomic identity is going to be subject to things like which elements are getting preserved and are you going to be able to distinguish between species. So at present, it seems that rhynchocephalians are both more abundant and more speciose than squamates. Of course, that's subject to change in the future. Um, in terms of ecomorphology, it, it definitely does seem that rhynchocephalians um, kind of have an upper upper edge on that. Like they, they achieve fairly early on things like uh, herbivory that it seems that squamates take a longer time to achieve. Um, but perhaps the most obviously is that in Europe at the time, in the late Jurassic, you get a bunch of semi-aquatic kind of elongate, more snake-like swimming rhynchocephalians. And we have no evidence of anything like that in the in the squamate realm. Like we, we have evidence that squamates are diversifying. We're getting multiple species of skinks. In Europe, you have like a lot of things that are probably geckos. Um, but and one thing that kind of hampers and has traditionally hampered our ability to distinguish these things is that they all still kind of look pretty similar to one another. They're all small bodied uh, insectivorous things that, um, you know, it's, it's not entirely clear what all their lifestyles are. There's evidence to suggest that some of them were at least somewhat scansorial, so they were climbing things. Um, obviously, we only have the skulls of Eoskinkus and, and Microteris, so it's hard to, to make any kind of lifestyle implications. Um, but lizards are diversifying, but it seems that they're at least somewhat at the moment in the Jurassic more constrained in like body form and in ecology. That changes once we get into the Cretaceous when we see a huge decline in rhynchocephalians. 
and we start to see squamates basically take over the small reptile role. And you start to actually see the emergence of things like recognizable snakes and big predatory lizards, including the mosasaurs, but also including things like monitor lizard relatives, Gila monster relatives. Um, you start to see more herbivorous lizards. Um, that all happens in the Cretaceous. Right. Okay. And, uh, I just wanted to ask, just to make sure that people know. So when you say ecomorphology, that means that it's how essentially like that you can tell that this animal was doing different things based on its skeleton, right? Essentially, yeah. It's, it's how does the morphology relate to ecology in the sense of like, what can we tell about its lifestyle? Like what was it eating? How is it moving around? What environments would it likely have then been moving around in? Um, that kind of stuff. Okay, well, Dalton, that was an excellent overview of your paper. But you didn't answer one of my questions. Oh. Which is, what about your paper is shitty? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <again. laughs> um, no, I mean, I think these are, like, they're not, they're good fossils. Um, Eoskinkus especially. Microteris is, is much more fragmentary. Um, but even with good fossils, you know, they're subject to to reanalysis in the future. And it's very possible that in the future, someone will run an analysis and find them in a different part of the tree. Um, but I think, you know, given that we've tested this under different regimes and then they've been allied with skinks in the past that I think a skink identity for these taxa is pretty, pretty robust, or a, I should say a pan skink. So that is to say they're outside of the entire modern group of skinks, but they're on that part of the family. Yeah. I think Amelia and I have the same question here. How do we tell from the fossil record that these skinks would pan? Oh, you can tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I have an eye for these things. So, Alex, would you like to talk about Spinosaurus now? God, no. But that's what we're going to do, because we're <laughs> professionals. So, um, in a paper I didn't work on, and for an organism I don't uh, have any real professional interest in, uh, I'm now going to talk to you about it, because there we had three papers to discuss, and I drew the short stick, or in this case, the very long stick. So, Spinosaurus aegypticus is you know a pretty famous dinosaur it's been in some films it's done some fun stuff in those films it eats some people it bites an airplane but our idea of the organism has changed quite a bit in the last eight years as we found more material of it uh we suspect it was more aquatic uh it has a weird fin tail its legs are much shorter than we thought um and it's generated a ton of debate and what a lot of that debate about is about is its ecology so was it that aquatic and our paper of was it this week still or was it last week how time does blur uh they have a very short title in which they say spinosaurus is not an aquatic dinosaur so that is their take so the recent evidence that had been put forward that spinosaurus was not only very comfortable in the water but was pursuing uh prey in the water column is a combination of several features of its osteology. So this includes, again, as I said, a weird kind of tall finned tail. So tall neural spines on its tail that gave it a, a bit of a, almost a fluke. I don't know if that's the right word because I don't work on mosasaurs, but it's got, it's got a tail with a fin. That's what I'm going to say. It has a swimmy um, tail. Swimmy tail. It also has very, very dense bones. Uh, um, it's femur. And I think some of the other long bones that were sampled by Fabry or was it just the femur? I don't remember. I can check that. Uh, regardless, some of its long bones, we can we can double check which ones, uh, which other ones, are incredibly dense. Uh, the, the open space that you often think about when you think of a bone in cross section are very small. It's filled in with densely packed bone. And this is a feature that's often seen in organisms that dive or spend quite, amount, uh, quite a large amount of time in the water. Uh, it makes sense. It makes their bodies dense so they don't have to actively keep pushing themselves down. Now, this most recent paper published by a large team, which includes Paul Serino, uh, an individual who's done quite a bit of work on the tax in the past, so, uh, they, they've essentially created, using multiple lines of evidence, a model of Spinosaurus aegypticus. And in their investigation, they find that the evidence, they, they find in their take that the evidence for a aquatic Spinosaurus aegypticus is wanting. Uh, um, amongst multiple lines of evidence, they suggest that it would be a very poor swimmer based on their model, unable to pursue prey quickly underwater, 
and that it would also be too buoyant. And I think that's where we're going to get into some of our, we'll say, conversation about what we think about, about these results and why we think what we think. But that's where the field currently stands. If you're unaware, uh, the holotype of Spinosaurus was destroyed during the Second World War um, by an allied bombing run. It was housed in Germany, uh, along with several other very nice fossils that were also turned to dust. It's worth pointing out that elements of the of the neotype that has been named Spinosaurus aegypticus do differ a little bit with what was reported in the holotype. I, I think what comes to mind immediately is the mylo mylohyoid foramen on the dentary mm -hmm. is pretty different between the holotype and what's been described in, in the neotype. It's not widely, and you know, I, I, I don't want to suggest that this this at isn't actually Spinosaurus. Um, Aegypticus, no. the author, the author, that's what the authors find, and it's what is discussed in the literature. But there are certainly some differences because, you know, we these are parts of different animals from possibly different life stages or other things. So it is a composite. Yeah. Um, and I guess so that's my immediate um, thought is that this is a very we don't that because it's a composite and because this this study in particular hinges on making a model based on a skeleton that we don't have right well so the only thing i'm thinking here is that it is worth noting two things one is that while alex will not propose that the new material is not spinosaurus aegypticus i have heard people say that and it is possible yeah. Although I think that given that the holotype was blown up in World War II and now exists as like atoms floating in the breeze, probably some of which are no longer even within the <laughs> Earth's atmosphere, I, I think it would be better to make the neo, like to just firmly establish a neotype and kind of reject the holotype. For all intents and purposes, this new material is Spinosaurus aegypticus. It is sure, what and... our understanding of the animal will be based on. And, and I think that's that this is actually, I don't want to segue into a completely different thing, but we, J, uh, Jimbo and I are certainly going to discuss, I guess also it's good for our viewers to know that we're going to call you Jimbo quite a bit. So I'm going to start doing it. Um, Thank you. Jimbo and I, a, a lot of our, our work, our coming work is going to be about just, just how do you diagnose a species in the fossil record? Right. Investigating that in, onto in you know, the, the ontology, the ontogeny. Ooh, I've been thinking too much about making matrices. But also, you know, the importance of holotypes, being able to assign other specimens to a holo to, to the taxa of the holotype and stuff like that. And there are dangers with, with kind of chimeric taxa, like Spinosaurus aegypticus, especially if you're interested in addressing questions about bi paleobiology and such. Right. And I mean, the issue of holotype reliability is something we talked about in the paper about the number of T-Rex species that I was on. Uh, mm -hmm. I was the co-lead author on that came out this summer, right, where we pointed out that if Greg Paul's T-Rex taxonomy is correct or, or used, it means that a lot of material can't actually be identified. And that combined with the fact that it was even good material that could be identified was one of the big reasons that we didn't think that that taxonomic arrangement was really warranted. Holotypes are important. And I think in this case, the most pragmatic thing would probably be to base the taxon solely on the neotype and not really consider the lost holotype anymore. The holotype doesn't exist anymore. And, and there's a lot of uncertainties inherent in uh, trying to study it just because it's only photographs. We'll never be able to see it. Right. It's yeah, not yeah. going to turn up. It, it is. I, it was atomized. Yeah. yeah I mean, in, in the case of Spinosaurus, we're, we are in the position where it's just we don't really have the option. The second point I wanted to make is that while as Amelia correctly pointed out, this is a potential weakness in the paper, that it's based on cross-scaling and the and a composite skeletal between several individuals that have a lot of uncertainties inherent in their identification and their study. It is the best that can be done here. Yes. And I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I am often somebody who talks about the limitations of the fossil record, and people have accused me of saying that we shouldn't even do paleontology because of those limitations. And I don't think I that that's that. true. Right. That was very funny yeah. when that happened. That was very funny when that happened. Um, it's happened since then, too. And <laughs> I don't think that. I think it's important to be circumspect in what we can really test. I think it's important to acknowledge when there are multiple competing hypotheses that can't be excluded from one another. And I think it's important to use the data that we have to try to address the questions that we want to address. The only sure. time where we shouldn't do that is if we obviously don't have the data that are necessary for the question. 
And here we have a decent amount of information about what this animal looked like. There is some uncertainty in it, but, you know, we generally know the body plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I guess to be, to be clear, it's like it was more so just that was my gut reaction of, oh, there really isn't a lot of this thing. And a mm -hmm. lot of it is separate individuals. So it wasn't to say that we can't do anything with it. Like, obviously, that's what com comparative anatomy is for. Um, but it just it, it struck me. And, and where it begins to, I don't want to say bother me, that's not very fair, but where I begin to take pause with that is can you create a good model of this organism? I think what I was going to, and what I was thinking of saying is, I think you can create a good enough model. Mm -hmm. like given the amount of material we have, and even with, you know, not 100% confidence in assigning holotype material to the composite, and like what we have, if we look at their diagram of the neotype and just the referred specimens, and, and the holotype actually doesn't contribute terribly much to the reconstruction that even if this isn't precisely what you know uh, the holotype version of Spinosaurus aegypticus looked like I think this is a decent approximation of what the neotype looks like and I think it, it's a decent approximation of at least what one of these animals would have looked like and I think sure using that you can make some inferences how many what, what are our ribs looking like According to there's Amelia, one. they're completely unrepresented. Or is there only there's one? Two, there's one from the holotype, so that doesn't count. And one and from the neotype. From they're both mid-dorsals. The, the neotype is a bit further back. Um, the holotype is like almost exactly the mid-dorsal. And the okay. neotype one does not have the associated vertebra. Uh, I also wanted to just make it clear to our listeners who might not be as entrenched in paleontology as we are, uh, that... What we're talking about here of uh, composite specimens and scaling and everything, this is not a unique issue to Spinosaurus. And this is not, this is also not something that is out of the question at all. This is, if anything, an incredibly common practice in paleontology. If any of you have had the privilege of visiting the American Museum of Natural History, if you see the Patagotitan the titanosaur that they have on display there, or I guess also because it's the same one if you've been to the Field Museum as well and seen Maximo in their uh, entryway. Uh, we do not have that entire specimen. Uh, no, sorry, we do not, we have that whole specimen. We don't have that whole skeleton. Uh, a lot of the body there is made off of inference that uh, because vertebrates are bio bilaterally similar. If you have the right arm, you know what the left arm looks like and vice versa. For the most part, we can make very strong evidence-based educated guesses as to what the entirety of an animal looks like from relatively scant material. Are we always right? No. Uh, case in point, things like Dinochirus, where we find out that the overall animal looked way weirder than we thought originally. But there are also way more cases where we find the more of an animal and it kind of just more or less looks like we thought it might. So I just wanted to make sure that we just, we're, we weren't saying that like, oh, these guys were doing something absolutely crazy by just Frankenstein skip, uh, stitching a dinosaur together out of random associated, loosely associated pieces. That's a very, very good point, Scott. But I do think it's important to note that Amelia is right. We are missing quite a bit of this. Right? We are. And, and we're missing a lot of the really weird parts, too. We are. So, like, yes, it's common practice to make a composite, and you often have to. I mean, listen, talking about the AMNH, Amelia, how many individuals is that Triceratops again? Yeah, you told me. I thought it was two or three. It's at least two. I think it's seven. Oh, God. Ugh. Oh, it's like the Peabody Stegosaurus. Jesus. There are... Certainly some arguments made in this paper that, that I, I personally would like to push back against, and not necessarily even arguments made in the paper, but just kind of issues that I think have framed this whole discussion and debate overall. And one of these is that there seems to be just kind of these two camps that have naturally formed. One is Spinosaurus is a shoreline waiter. It is wading along the shore and it's snapping up nice big fish. But it's not a pursuit predator underwater. 
it's not very good at submerging itself, and it's not very good at swimming quickly. And that is what the more recent paper argues based on the model that they generate, that this is not an efficient swimming animal, um, and it would have trouble submerging due to its uh, buoyancy, its internal buoyancy they calculate for their model. And then the other camp is that this is this is a river-going predator that is swimming down big fish and taking a big yummy chunk. Um, these are not the only two options. <laughs> there is an enormous smear of, ecology, of possible ecology in between these two. And I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, and I, I really don't think even either are, either of the camps and the people who contribute to these papers really even think that these are the only two options. But it seems to be that's where when, when we see the debate, it's always, oh, it couldn't do this, it couldn't do that. It has to be X, it has to be Y. And there are there is evidence that favors an organism an organism that can submerge itself like its dense bones. Um, and also evidence that it, you know based on their model that it probably was not a very quick swimmer. But that then lead into the into the issue of if you are a fifty foot long animal in a river, eating fish that are like the length of a man that you know might not be the fastest organism in the world. Do you need to be a very fast pursuit predator? Are you an ambush predator? Are you sitting on the bottom like a hippo? If you're a wader, how are you wading? Like, that's an issue I have. The animal's body is so long and its legs are so short, right? Like if it's standing with its chest in the water, sure, but the water could effectively stand in like that is not particularly deep. Right? Like the, the, the entire construction of a wading predator is height, is to minimize your silhouette and strike from a distance as a bird. So there's there's you know plenty plenty of discussion to be had on on what could this ecology suggest. One thing that, pardon me, I'd like to spend just a tiny amount of time on, and I'd like to say that I I think the case that the authors make in this new paper that Spinosaurus was a poor swimmer is compelling. The sail would create a ton of drag. It would not be a good swimmer. It's 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 basically like one of the worst shaped animals to swim good, but, but it's very dense. The issue I find and I have with it is that the buoyancy seems kind of weird to me. They're saying that this is an animal that is is unable to submerge itself effectively, um, to dive so to speak. And in their in their work, they're getting kind of the, this buoyancy score score for, you know, how much force does Spinosaurus have to generate to submerge itself? And they get a huge value. It's, it's got to generate, I think, what, 125 times what the tail would normally produce or the maximum thrust the tail could produce. Is there, do we have the plot for that? I'm trying to find the correct plot for that. An absurd amount of, of, of power would have to be exerted to force yourself down underwater now. Are the legs playing a role that not really relevant to this point, what they're saying, the tail's not strong enough. Now Fabry et al. in their most recent paper show that the tail is vastly more effective for as, as a swimming organ than it is in any other theropod. And several, you know, quite a bit, like eight times better than in any other theropod alive, but it's not as good as say something like an alligator or crocodiles. And they are decent swimmers but they're not pursuing prey actively in the water column. Caimans sometimes sort of do with fish, but it's still a lot of ambush, wait and snap. So, you know, this is not a crew, this is not a, a zipping little guy like a sailfish or anything like that. However, yeah, back to the buoyancy. So the, the score they get for the buoyancy is making Spinosaurus less dense than sauropod, a, a sauropod like Diplodocus, where the axial skeleton is massively invaded with air sacs. Like cervicals, dorsals, far more than any of the vertebrae are invaded in Spinosaurus. Now Spinosaurus has pleuroceles. These are the spaces that the air sacs, part of the lung makes in birds. That's important in other uh, very efficient respirating. So we know that these features are in dinosaurs based on these kind of spaces they carve out into the bone. We call these pleuroceles. Um, they're in most sauropods and most theropods. The kind of disparity in how 
abundant they are varies. Uh, Spinosaurus is not a pneumatic, but it has an incredibly standard theropod distribution. It's got them in its cervicals, and I think it has them only in a few dorsals. There's nothing in its sacrals. There's no pneuma pneumatization in its forelimbs or hind or, or or its girdle. Well, we don't have any girdles, so we don't really know. I'm I'm sorry, we don't have any clavicles or parts of the sternum, which are sometimes invaded in birds. But essentially, so the model, at least the one that that, that they ultimately run with, is a avian-like distribution of air sacs, which I'm not super confident in. And the fact that they're somehow getting that this animal is less is less dense than than a a ground a, a terrestrial bird or a sauropod, it seems pretty weird to me. And I'm not totally sure how they're getting it. I haven't picked through their their math. It seems like it would be wrong, especially based on th the fact that we know this animal has incredibly dense long bones. So, yeah, I don't. I, I I'm I'm not totally sure what to think about that. And. They kind of, I think an assumption has been made that it has a very avian like air sac system. And like I said before, in birds, we have these air sacs in the vertebrae, but they also go into the arms. Like the, the humerus is pneumatized uh, much more than just the vertebrae are pneumatized in birds. Um, and they are full of spaces. And in theropods, especially this far down in the tetanurans, uh, the vertebrae, like they're just not that pneumatic. Um, the the kind of first theropod where we really start to see elements beyond the dorsal vertebrae get pneumatized is uh, is by the time we're in, I think it's, I want to say, Megaraptorans, because Erosteon's a Megaraptoran, and that's really the first where we get such a de such a degree of of axial pneumaticity. Anyway, you so mean yeah, appendicular I, I, pneumaticity? Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, where we, you're getting it outside of the vertebra, uh, across the body, right. and that seems to be convergent with birds too, because the the patterns of pneumaticity are incredibly, they they vary widely across their parts. Right. I mean, I was going to say dromaeosaurids don't have pneumatic humeri, oviraptorosaurids don't. So no, no it, very few dinosaurs do. Right. So it's and really mo mostly a bird thing. Yeah, and like some very birdy dinosaurs don't have like Mononychus is completely pneumatic, which is concerning but whatever so anyway yeah so I, I i i'm kind of hesitant about the the degree of pneumaticity that's being reconstructed here and again the buoyancy scores seem very strange to me based on the density of the bone now as as has been discussed diving birds so birds that might demonstrate a similar ecology are almost always a pneumatic this doesn't mean birds that are pneumatic can't dive. Most, almost all ducks are heavily pneumatic, uh, and they do it fine, even just for a little bit. Sometimes their butts bob up, but some of the really committed ones can propel themselves underwater with their with their wings. Skill issue. Skill issue. So yeah, right. Like we actually really can't make a statement for how large the air sacs or the lungs are, because. You can have air sacs in, in taxa that don't have pleurocyles, don't have those spaces in the vertebra. So we're, we're stuck in kind of a, a, a tough spot, and we, we actually don't have a good understanding for how the, the degree of axial pneumaticity, how many of those pleurocyles you have, changes how, how large your air sacs are. And I say that as a pitch to my own work because I'm going to try to figure that out at some point. I don't know when. So yeah. Not not to ramble too much. I I'm just very uh, very suspicious, not suspicious, but I just I'm not sure about that buoyancy score. It seems much too high. And, and I think that that's going to affect a lot of the results here. I also want to emphasize this does not look like an animal that was a particularly good swimmer to me. We're going to talk yeah. about another animal that doesn't look like a particularly good swimmer next. Um, but this like this is pretty clearly not. This is not a swordfish. This is not a shark. It's not a mosasaur, right? This is not any of those aquatic pursuit predators. I don't think that the two statements, this animal was not an aquatic pursuit predator, and this animal foraged for food underwater, are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I basically convinced myself that this is like a hippo that eats big fish. Right. Yeah. 
Perhaps yeah, even Angela doing a little bit of ambush predation on land as well. Sure. Could do it. I mean, it looks crocky. Right, Lots like, what, we know crocky. that some spinosaurus, we know that spinosaurs, we don't know if they're hunting them, but we know that they, they're they eating small ornithopods, like baryonyx. We know they're eating pterosaurs, like ir irritator. And we know that they're eating fish. So, like... Right. And I mean, like, dental specialization-wise, these oh, yeah, are no, clearly eating they're fish. They're piscivores. Right. They're mostly piscivores. It's also... Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Sorry. Uh, also, according to the Fabry paper, the baryonyx was one of the ones that was recovered as more dense and more... Yeah, so actually, that's something I really want to talk about. Yeah. Um, which is kind of in the discussion... Right, so it's, it's noteworthy that baryonyx is incredibly dense but is not as squat as Spinosaurus. And, and we so, have a lot of Baryonyx. We have less of Baryonyx than you think. We have a lot of Suchomimus. Oh. Okay. Which we have, a de like, compared to other Spinosaurus, there is some for good old, for good old Barry, like, but... Compared it's to not, other Spinosaurus, it's a pretty weak statement. Yeah, it's <laughs> not like, like, so Irritator is surprisingly good. Mm. I recently pulled in like a basically in a complete palette out of it, which is something I never thought I'd get from a Spinosaur. Hmm. But it's right. So Baryonyx, we're like, oh, it, it seems like it's missing these these anatomical adaptations for for an aquatic lifestyle. But when you look at it, uh, sure, maybe its its hind limbs are a little longer, but we actually don't have any of its tail. Mm. And when I say any, I mean we don't have we don't have the parts of the tail that would indicate if it had a fin or not, like Spinosaurus, like only Centra. We actually only have chevrons. Only yeah, chevrons. Okay. It's not great. But you know what's great is we also only have one centrum. Am I correct about this? Hold on, let me check the reconstruction. According to the Fabry paper, we have seven vertebral centra and one vertebral neural arch from the caudal series of Suchomimus too. So we have no idea if this had a fin and the neural spine of Suchomimus is pretty thin and rod-like. So something that I guess I hadn't thought about or really, I, something that I appreciate that they did do in this paper is they actually show a bunch of tails next to each other of aquatic things and other things. And it's like, okay, that actually does a good job of showing or like i it's interesting to me that it is more similar to a basilisk lizard than anything else so basilisk lizards obviously don't swim with their tails they use them as display structures um and the neural spines are really tall and thin and rod like and all of the aquatic animals they're not like they've got they've got a newt which they don't have anything there i wonder if there isn't cartilage at play because it's an amphibian and amphib amphibians are cursed um but there's no bony neural spines supporting the tail uh mosasaurs um don't don't have tall, thin spines like this. They have regular spines that are a little bit taller, but they're, like, not skinny. Um, crocodilian doesn't really have tall, thin, skinny things. A cetacean, I'm going to be honest here, I don't know why they're showing that, because they're not at all analogous, because they move completely differently, and, of course, they're not going to have a mediolaterally compressed tail. Um, so it's not, it doesn't, it, anyways. Right. But they show it, because it's a comparison. It's another secondarily aquatic thing. Might as well show it. Um, but anyways... Of of all of those things, the Spinosaurus doesn't look like any of them, which is interesting. It looks like the display structure of the Basilisk Lizard. That's not to say they didn't use it to swim. Like, maybe it was different. I don't know. Because, like, on, I mean, you know, in terms of scale, a newt is this big. It doesn't necessarily need bone to support that little, little, um, little paddle that it has. So I think that that's also kind of an important point here is that, yeah... For right now, it looks the most like a basilisk lizard, but... So, so how, how does Hydrosaurus swim? Hydrosaurus? Not, uh, what's the bat, what's the basilisk lizard? Basilisk? Um, it's I basilisk. mean, they don't... Guess. Right. Yeah. They don't, they just kind of... Are they undulating? The, Are they going... They just do the squat, yeah, they just wiggle, like... Okay. They just do basic, you know, like, ancestral reptile wiggling but they're not, like, propelling themselves with their tails. Sure. Like, their tails are primarily for display. Um, but then also, again, it's a there's a scaling difference. There's a huge scaling difference between these animals. Like you don't, like I said, with the newt, you don't really 
need bony support for a little fin because they're little animals and it doesn't weigh anything versus, you know, however the hell long the Spinosaurus tail is. That's a lot of animal to to move. But can right. I ask a, a question? A lot of bony support. Uh, bony, bony support. Sure. So if Basiliscus is doing mediolateral undulation mm-hmm. or whatever the right term is, yeah. that sail is contributing it's contributing yeah so actually that'd be an interesting thing to look into is if it's dalton it's sexually dimorphic isn't it the i i'm I'm not sure off the top of my head i suspect that it is but because well because the one that they have i know that the head is dimorphic yeah the the cask is um... so that would be a really fun hey kids you want a science project make a bunch of male and female basilisk lizards swim and see which ones do it better or make models of them. It's not that hard and do the same thing they did here. Um, because it would be interesting to see, like, you know, even though it's not the point, does it contribute? Right. And that's what I was kind of getting at. Like, yeah. Spinosaurus was going to be swimming by axial side to side undulation. It, it's yeah. a reptile. That's yeah. how it swam if it was swimming. But yeah. because of that, that, like having any dorsal surface area there is going to do something for that process. Right, like Hydrosaurus is that other lizard that Alex mentioned that also has a big sail on its tail. Mm-hmm. I think and it swims a lot. It's semi-aquatic, right? I think that this is something that's often lost in discussions of comparative anatomy and functional morphology. One is that there are multiple ways to achieve the same biomechanical solution, right? Like none of those aquatic or secondarily aquatic tetrapods have the same tail structure. They have all done this differently. Mm-hmm. Right, and I mean, like the whale, I think is presented just to show that the like the fins of the fluke don't have bony support, mm-hmm. which is like I guess a fair point, even though I don't know what that would be in in a mammalian tail. Well, neither but, does the mosasaur. Mm. Right. Well, I mean, that's their point: is that the, there's yeah. not usually a bony support. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there can't be. Right. This right. is just how this this is how this challenge was solved in these different lineages. So I, it's certainly an argument against Spinosaurus using its tail for swimming. I will concede that, but I don't think that it shows that the tail could not have been used for swimming. One of the more compelling points of the paper, I think, is the, their like, comparison of appendage area to, to body length, which is that like, for the size of the animal, which Spinosaurus is humongous, it doesn't have that large of appendages to act as like, control surfaces underwater. And so like, I'm sure kicking could help propel it. Um, but there is definitely something to be said that like it doesn't have control surfaces to 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 navigate the water in a particularly like graceful way. But again, that goes to the point that I think we've we've said already that like as a swimmer, I think we're all in agreement that and in, in, in agreement with this paper that Spinosaurus is not like an excellent swimmer. But it makes me think of Nothosaurus. What do Nothosaurus do? Aren't they short armed and just long? They're just kind of long and noodly. I thought they had little, like, weird hands, too, but I don't know. Well, I mean, crocodiles barely right have fins or control surfaces, right? I mean, yeah. they're, they're certainly yeah. living in the water, and they're fairly adept in it. And I think they just use their webbed hands to control themselves. Now, there's a scaling issue there, right? The amount of turbulence yes. and drag a Spinosaurus right. is going to be producing is much greater. Like a log in a river. Mm-hmm. Right. There's... There's a point to the whole thing that I'm very curious about that I haven't seen presented yet. And I'm sure the data already exists and is probably published upon, um, which is like, to what degree does the kind of water that it's that, that this animal would be swimming in matter? Like to my understanding, and I could be completely wrong about this because I haven't read the literature extensively on like the chem chem and whatever, is that these aren't like fast rivers. It's like they're big, deep, very slow moving bodies of water. And and Spinosaurus is going to generate a huge amount of drag, and it does carry a big billboard on its back to help like that would get pushed over in 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 fast water. But like, what is the environment of these things that they're actually in? Because if it's if it's very calm water, I can I can easily see the kind of hippopotamus style, like just kind of ambling around in the water thing. And I mean, they had to swim at some point. I mean, even if they're if it's not how they're feeding, if it's not how they're traditionally locomoting, like living by the water, being a fish eater, you're going to swim on occasion at the very least. Right. I I also think that it's worth noting that like this is a uh, this is a big river environment, right? 
big slow river is what it seems to be. I, I also do not read a tremendous amount on the paleo environment of the chem chem. Well, it's a fossil, so the chances of it being like deposited well, in a slow moving river are basically 80% already. Right, that's true. That's a good point. I guess what I was trying to get at is it's very possible that Spinosaurus is kind of just a weird thing, right? Like, there are weird animals that live in very specialized environmental situations in the present day. It's possible that we've, like, happened and found one in the fossil record. Just a weird type of body plan that kind of is very jury-rigged for what lifestyle it's living. Sure. And presumably doesn't really become that successful because Spinosaurus have a very limited fossil record. Right, Which they, is surprising if they were a very marine group. Or they didn't last group. very long. Right, it's sure. like they're only in the early Cretaceous. Like it might be an unsuccessful radiation. Right? Well, I mean, yeah, they're only in the early Cretaceous, but they're they they're going like past the Cinnamanian. They're not like they're around for at least like forty fifty million years, right? I think. Are they? I didn't think yeah. so. How old is Baryonyx? On it. It's Baremian. I thought. Maybe not anymore. Uh, let's see. Yep. Okay, and then when's the last occurrence of Spinosaurus? Well, that isn't that a good question. Looks like... Um... Yeah, no, you're right, Alex. It's about a 40 million year history. Yeah, I mean, so it's not like nothing. Right. The fact that they're rare and aquatic and big is interesting to me. Well, not necessarily. I'm just, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm no expert in like taphonomy, but like the big mosasaurs are rare too. Like okay. for whatever reason, like clearly they got huge, but like think like things in the scale of like. And we do have a ton of these teeth, right? Like. Yeah. Well, just... uh, yes, same. We got a ton of spinosaur teeth. Same thing. We got a ton of mosasaur teeth. We got a ton of big mosasaur teeth, but not a lot of big skeletons. A gotcha. lot of average, like, uh, yeah. So I don't. Again, I don't know how ta what you know the details of it are, but maybe there's a preservational bias against mm -hmm. huge things or in aquatic environments for whatever reason. Aquatic. Uh, or I mean, I think it's also possible that this is kind of multiple layers here. Mm -hmm. We don't tend to find spinosaurs in very speciose or very productive strata, right? Like they're they're not living in the dinosaur park formation or the Jadakta. Mm. Yeah. So and maybe it's a factor of they only tend to be found like, and this is certainly a geological consequence, right? We tend to find them in strata that don't produce a lot of vertebrate remains. The only exception to that is Suchomimus. Irritators from a logger stratum, right? Yeah, irritators sure. from the Romaldo formation, which is just just chock full of pterosaurs, which is Are these, not is this... something that you normally hear about. Irritator is from a Lagerstadt that's mostly small-bodied animals. It's like the Jadakta formation. It is, or like the Yishan mm -hmm. formation, where you find or very Solnhofen. or Solnhofen, where you find very occasionally large-bodied animals in something that's dominated by very small animals. Yeah. So that explains why you don't find more of Irritator. Now, Niger is only really explored by Serino's team. So it's not a heavily worked area. It's very productive. To my knowledge, all other Spinosaurs are coming from these areas that are notorious for producing really fragmentary scrappy material. So it's not surprising that we're not finding a lot of Spinosaurus material. Or that, like, the main thing we'd find are the teeth, which is notorious. Right? In the chem, chem you find so many spinosaur teeth. Right? But we don't find a lot of body fossils in the chem, chem. The, I mean, that's talked about very frequently. We know that a lot of stuff's present, and we're just not finding a lot of good fossil material. So, I, I mean, I think that that's, that's a critical thing. And this is what I always talk about with the Jadakta, which actually is going to segue in very well to our next segment. Right? Like, when you bury stuff in the Jadakta formation in Mongolia, you're burying it under a collapsing sand dune or in a sandstorm. That, right. That's how you're burying it. So it has very little relation to what's even living there or even necessarily dying there. It, it's a very particular mode of preservation to make it a fossil. 
right? We often think of fossilization as this random signal where like there's a, a low but even chance that things will be fossilized. And so we think about it as something that's definitely biased by small sample size, but not something that's likely to pre be presenting a skewed version of what the ecosystem looked like. Definitely. Where, where it is absolutely skewed because the way that you fossilize in every particular geological setting can be different and you need to have different expectations about what that will mean. And that's critical to interpreting these faunas. Before we completely get off spinosaurs, and this could also be an interesting segue into, into uh, Natovenator, or Natovenator, I'm not sure how we say it. Uh, one of the lines of evidence that's, that's cited in uh, Spinosaurus is non-aquatic dinosaur for its kind of buoyancy, or it, it can't be, its inability to submerge is um, that it has an incompressible lung so, I mean, very quickly, what this means is that birds have a have a kind of this lung that, that is rigid in that it is stuck up between the ribs, kind of this furrowed thoracic cavity versus something like an alligator in which the top of the thoracic cavity is smooth and the lung can actually be moved back and forth. Um, this is in part how an alligator or a crocodile breathes. In dinosaurs, the, the articulations of the ribs to the uh, to the vertebra is very similar to birds. So they have this thur uh, furrowed thoracic cavity that's just a rigid lung, um, and that the lungs themselves couldn't be changed in the way that the lungs of marine reptiles were. The issue here, as was pointed out to me, in fact, by one of the authors uh, of, of, of the study who, when I, when I asked about this, I was curious about it, um, birds diving birds seem to do fine with this limitation like penguins have these lungs have have what we would consider incompressible lungs but they are still capable divers and can stay down there for a while um it's believed that maybe the air sacs are playing a role maybe uh it seems that they're experiencing like partial hypothermia but there are solution like because you you have this lung does not mean that you are unable to dive. If you're a penguin, right? You're a penguin. You're you're a fun little. I guy. wish. <laughs> but you you still have to force yourself underwater with like your stupid arms, and you're still mostly air. Okay, um, we're gonna change topics from Spinosaurus because we're all sick of it. Um, can't wait for the can't can't wait for a response paper. It's gonna be a lot of fun to talk about it again. Um. But we're going to talk about another semi-aquatic theropod, poss possibly semi-aquatic theropod. And I think uh, before we get into it, I think we should, we should introduce it with a story, uh, which was several weeks ago, I was, I was on Morphosaurus doing what I usually do, which is looking desperately for any CT data with a pallet in it to add to my growing mountain, my, my dragon's horde of pallet, pallet data that consumes every waking moment of my life. Um, and I was going through, I was searching by tax on Amorphosaurus, and I'm going to the Dromaeosaurus. I'm like, all right, well, there's definitely nothing I don't have here. And I see just this name, Natovenator. I'm like, oh, I've never heard of that. And I open it, and I'm like, well, that looks like a house, that looks like a very nice house Graptorine skull. And I, I just, I'm like, all right, maybe I haven't heard of it. And I'm Googling, I'm like, oh, I've never heard of this thing. And I just take screenshots, and I'm like, James, what is this? <laughs> is this a new taxa? <laughs> Why is it on Morphosaurus? Why is it? And so I, I, what I ended up doing was I, I ended up um, emailing, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, a South Korean paleontologist who had uploaded the scans. And I was saying, hey, is this for something in press? Because I'm like, I, you know, I couldn't really tell if it had a pallet or not, but at this point I was kind of into the mystery. And then lo and behold, uh, not long after this this would break and i would be like oh okay so they apparently sometimes if i guess you have data from morphosaurus that it goes up before your papers are published i i think you can control when it goes up i think i guess they were they, they tease it was a little easter egg i wonder if anyone besides me noticed in probably the probably not i also i i mean i guess if the paper's accepted you might as well put it up well um, and it turns out it does have a bit of power. Well, you know what's great about putting up your data on online repositories is um, I continue to get emails from people reminding me that I forgot to put it up for the Kuru data set on Morphobank. Yep. And, yep, it's 
it's fun because every so often I'm like, I should upload that. And then I forget. And then I get an email from a researcher around the world who would like to replicate our analyses. And then I have to send them the data set. So uh, it's good to upload your data, even if you have to do it before the paper comes out to make sure you remember. So do it. Everybody should upload your data. So give me your CT data. It's all for hours. Stop. Give it to me. <laughs> so I want to talk about Natovenator. So for those of you who are unaware, Hoshkaraptorines are this enigmatic group of early diverging dromaeosaurid dinosaurs. The first one described was Mahakala, which was found at Tugurkin Shire in the Gobi Desert. It's a Jadakta formation sediment. It was described by my colleague and friend Alan Turner as part of his doctoral work at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, Mahakala was a pretty incomplete specimen. There was enough there to know it was a dromaeosaur. There's a little bit of brain case. There's a frontal. There, so there's limited cranial material, um, and there's some postcranial material as well. Obviously a dromaeosaur, obviously quite early diverging. And so that featured prominently in an early discussion of dromaeosaur body size evolution because they start very small and get bigger. Right? And that was the first evidence we really had for that trend in them. Critically, we didn't really have any of the ecomorphologically informative areas of that skeleton. And so it was not until 20, late 2017, I think it was December 2017, I actually remember I was at a bar with Alan when it came out. And we were looking at it like, what the hell is that? And Hoshkaraptor was published. Hoshkaraptor was found at Ukatolgad. It's It was originally a poached specimen. So fossil poaching is a really big problem in Mongolia. Um, this specimen had been poached and sold and then bought by a man whose name I can't pronounce that I'll put on the screen right now, and f who gave it back to science, thankfully. Yeah. Right. And it's, been, it's now accessioned at the Mongolian Institute. All is very well. The specimen was saved. And Hoshkaraptor shows a lot of weird traits, right? Um, almost all theropod dinosaurs have four premaxillary teeth. This is like one of the most stable traits I've ever seen. Hoshkaraptor has 11. Ew. That's more. That's, it's more. It might be, it might be nine. It's like, it's like more than twice as many. I forget the exact number. I, wait, I could have the paper open right now. That's consistent. We have not, the not in the premaxilla, but that like high number of teeth is something that's rather consistently found in early members of like Silurosaur clades for some reason, and I don't know why. Right, like Haplochiris has forty teeth in its mouth and its like upper tooth row. Well, like Animus I... has even more. Well, I think that what's going on is that it's a generalized micropredatory thing. Like things mm -hmm. that eat small prey tend to have a lot of teeth. Okay. Troodontids too, right? Right. Troodontids have like really high tooth counts and they maintain those though. Mm -hmm. Like even in Tyrannosaurus, like there's a general trend, right? Like Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus, Displetosaurus tend to have 14 maxillary teeth thereabouts, plus or minus one. Right. And then in Rex, you've got an adult's 11 or 12 maxillary teeth. And in more basal members of the clade, you've got more maxillary teeth. So as they're increasing their putative prey size, the number of teeth is decreasing as each tooth gets larger. The exact same thing is happening in the mosasaurs too, both with body size and with position on the tree. So like basal things like halosaurines have a shit, have a shit ton of teeth. And then both lin both major lineages, the russosaurines and the mosasaurines independently reduce tooth count. So as you head towards Tylosaurus, Mosasaurus respectively, they go from 15, 18 down to like 12, 13. And actually now I'm thinking Pliopletocarpines, same thing. They reduce it down to 12, 13. Right. So, so like, in dromaeosaurids, we see the same tendency. So we've got these basal members with lots of teeth in their jaws. Uh, Hoshkaraptorines and Inlogians seem to have supernumerary dentition. And then in more derived dromaeosaurids that seem to be eating prey that's large relative to their own body size, all of a sudden they've got, like, tyrannosaur-like tooth counts. So it seems to be a pretty general trend, right? Velociraptor's got... Tw well, the holotype of Velociraptor has 10 teeth in the maxilla. Yeah, and then other things change that, and we'll talk about that when those papers come out. In uh, which will happen prior to, maybe just prior to the heat death of the universe. <laughs> the universe. It'll so come out. don't worry, kiddos. So yes, I checked. I did check. Hoshkaraptor has eleven teeth in the premaxilla, Jesus which is Christ. insane. So, 
So just because I work on dumb animals that fuse the premax into one bone, this is 11 per side. 11 per side. Oh, wow. That's disgusting. Yeah. Oh, my Almost God. Almost. It's a lot. Jeez. I, this, this is a reconstruction of a velociraptor skull, and the premax would be here at the front. And you can see that there are one, two, three, four teeth in the premax of this reconstructed velociraptor skull. And with Houseraptor, it has 11 teeth in that space, with this also being the maxilla, just to give you a, a, a orientation on the skull here. Maxilla, premaxilla, premaxilla in front of the maxilla. Right. And now, one thing I want to point out is that the premaxilla in Houseraptor is elongated to accommodate that number of teeth. It's not just like a, a, an absurd number crammed into the tiny space. It's a little, um, it's quite a bit longer. Are but the teeth I don't different know. in the morphology? In the Halshkaraptor? Yeah, are, are they like thin and blade-like, or, or do they look different? I I think they're pretty Xiphodont. I wanted to say, could you define Xiphodont? Because that is... Oh, um, yeah, that, that's a good... That is a really... That's inside baseball. Term. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very simply, blade-like and recurved. Right. So anyway, there's a couple of uh, there were a couple of pieces of evidence that the authors of the description of Halshkaraptor used to propose a semi-aquatic mode of life for the clade. Um, one of those are a network of neurovascular canals in the premaxilla that they state are much more extensive than are seen in terrestrial animals, but are similar to the condition in semi-aquatic reptiles. Uh, the number of teeth is increased, which is also seen in Piscivorous theropods but as we've discussed that's a pretty general uh basal solar basal member of any solaris or clade thing to have a lot of teeth yeah um the teeth lack serrations which is very common for paravian dinosaurs but also seen in spinosaurs so there's a lot of things that in a phylogenetic context aren't actually that odd but that are to some degrees also similar to what you see in fish eating animals it has a very long neck it's kind of very vaguely swan or goose shaped. Um, and there's an analysis presented that tries to argue, and I haven't really gone into the data to analyze this too much, that seems to argue that the front limbs are showing adaptations and morphology that are convergent on paddles, both in semi-aquatic reptiles or fully aquatic reptiles, and in wing-propelled diving birds. And that's what gets us to this paper, because this is a new Halskoraptorine. Um, called Nato Venator or Nato Venator, meaning swimming hunter in Latin, for those of you who are cultured. So yes. the skull of Nato Venator looks a lot like the skull of Falschgeraptor, which is nice because there had been some, I know there had been some discussion wondering if the skull of Falschgeraptor had been messed with to some degree. Um the paper, to its credit, does a fairly extensive job of showing that it was not a forgery, it was not a fake, like, this, this was a real animal. Um, I know that there were whispers that it could have been, but I think given the skull, we can be very confident that it's not. The, they were mm -hmm. correct in their assessment that the fossil was genuine. Hoshkaraptorians really looked like this, which is cool. They're, they're weird-looking animals. Um, the frontals are very similar to what you see in Mahakala, so, so that's nice. Um, but we get into the rest of the body. It's not an incredibly complete skeleton. This is from the Baron Goyot beds. Um, I think it's actually from Hulsan, right? Or it's from Hirmin Sav? It, it is from Hirmin Sav, right. So Baron Goyot deposits, and this gets into what people have been blowing up my Twitter inbox about for the last three days with no sign of cessation. <laughs> It, so the Baron Goyote is this um, interesting and often overlooked bed in the Gobi. Broadly speaking, in the late Cretaceous Gobi Desert, there are three rock units that we work in. And these are very, very broadly considered. There's the Jadakta Formation, which is the very typical, like, bright red sandstones that we see a lot of the AM and H Gobi fossils found in. The Baron Goyote, which is a still arid depositional sand dune deposit that is not characterized by bright red sediments and tends to have a slightly different vertebrate assemblage. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And the Nemet, which is more traditional fluvial sandstones and mudstones. 
right? The Nemet is an alluvial paralic system. It's like the dinosaur park or the Hell Creek. It's very rich in fossils still, dramatically so. Um, but it's a, it's a more traditional dinosaur bearing deposit. What's very notable is that these collapsed sand dunes that tend to bury things in these dune systems are really, really good at preserving small-bodied animals. So you only really tend to find very small-bodied animals in remarkable numbers at those types of localities. The interesting thing, or one of the many interesting things about the Jadakta, Barangoyot, and Nemet deposits are that we have like no real, we have very, very few observed contacts of them. And we don't really understand how they relate to each other confidently. The traditional interpretation is that Jadakta was older than Barangoya, which was older than Nemet, and that this was an environmental change occurring over time, where you're going from an arid desert to a more, like, a, a wetter, more humid system that's got rivers and everything. A more modern interpretation that I believe, based on having read one of the papers about it, although I don't believe all of the arguments in the paper specifically about faunal composition, is that these are actually all one environment that is being preserved in different places at different times, where you've got rivers and then interdune, or um, you've got like this barren goyote transitional facies, which is like dunes that are existing with lakes and rivers between them, maybe even ephemeral lakes and rivers transitioning to a Jadakta, like, wholly arid dune sea environment that's reminiscent of the Sahara. Although it can't entirely be reminiscent of the Sahara because we know there's plant life there. So it might be, like, it might be dunes with pockets of life between them, something like that. In any case, there's pretty good evidence that collapsing sand dunes are the main mode of deposition. And in those dune environments, you only really get small animals, nothing larger than a human most of the time. Ankylosaurs are an exception, and they might be an exception just because they're very low to the ground. So their mass is very high, but they're easy to bury. And they're also easy to keep together. Yeah. Right. Right. We we really don't find body fossils of anything larger. There's like, I think, a single unpublished skeleton of a large theropod from the Jadakta. Mm. Um, and it's not much of it. It's nowhere. It's not one of these things that's pu beautifully preserved and fully articulated like you always see in these sediments, right? These animals are buried alive. They don't decompose before they're buried. They don't get scattered. It's pretty cool. Where is the Megtosaurus from? The, the Nemec. It's from. I'm Nemec. realizing now that I said it. Interesting out. question. <laughs> 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 right. So the interesting thing with this animal is that there's one particular functional adaptation that is discussed, and I'm trying to scroll there very quickly. If you look at its rib cage, the ribs are back swept. They they emerge at an acute angle with the rest of the vertebral column rather than a right angle, as in a lot of other theropods. And the authors suggest that this is similar to what's seen in diving birds. And given prior suggestions that these are wing propelled divers, they're interpreting this as further evidence for this diving lifestyle for these animals. Now, what I pointed out in a tweet that was apparently very funny that I intended for maybe five people to see, is it sure is interesting that we keep finding these diving animals in sand dune deposits. Now, a lot of people have taken issue with this, and quite rightly, because I didn't use enough nuance in my tweet, because I only have 280 characters to work with, that I am criticizing the presumed ecology based on where they're found. And that's not true. Because I recognize that small-bodied animals like this only really get preserved in sand dune deposits. So even if it was not in the typical place that it lived, it, it's getting deposited there. The fossil is being formed there because that's the place that can form that fossil. It remains the case that there is some water in these ecosystems. There's life. There has to be water, right? So it's not implausible based on the environment that these things are to some degree hunting fish and maybe being a little bit more aquatic in some way. There's been a lot of discourse on Twitter about, like, what birds are a good modern analog for this. And no, the answer is probably none of them. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right. But I think it's instructive to kind of talk about it because it really, it speaks to the way we really try to understand the fossil record. Like, this animal doesn't look dissimilar from a wading bird in the it's way it's nice reconstructed. 
Well, we don't know it has long legs because the tibia tarsus is not preserved. But um, <laughs> if it's like Alshkaraptor, it's got long legs, which it seems like they it might have like long Alshkaraptor. Legs. Probably has long legs. Um, I would buy it as a waiting predator. But the problem is that's not the argument the paper puts forward. The paper is putting forward that this is an equivalent to a cormorant or something that is a diving, wing-propelled diving predator with these really long legs and a rib cage that is similar in construction to something seen in, like, a loon or a cormorant. And I think so, it's worth pointing out that, like, before we get farther into this, like, the, the, the ratio of wing in a cormorant to, like, body is incredibly more substantial than it is in these animals the forelimbs are actually kind of short right and i and also like cormorants have short legs right diving birds in general have short legs right so there's a lot of kind like of spinosaurus so so i feel like in general <laughs> sorry it's okay i feel like in general this is almost having it both ways we're like, we agree that it looks like a wading bird, so we say it's plausible that it is semi-aquatic like the authors propose. But that's not what the authors are proposing. Yeah. And that's actually not what the anatomical evidence would suggest. Like, this ribcage does look a lot like a loon. Loons are not wading birds. Wading birds do not have backswept ribs like this. One other point that's important that was brought up a lot is that you do get diving birds in fairly inland environments. They are not restricted to the coast. Diving birds do an interesting thing called flying <laughs> that, that was a little sassy wait you mean they'd be able to get from a place that's sandy to a place that's nice and wet pretty quick they would be able to do it really quick they take the bus <laughs> <laughs> and halshka raptorines can't fly so i don't think that animals that are flying and highly mobile as a result of that and able to occupy these very small and potentially ephemeral lakes between sand dunes is a good model to justify this existing in that ecosystem. I am again not how, saying it's impossible, but do I don't think that that's in land. This is. It looks like Mongolia is essentially <laughs> dead center of the landmass that it's on, which is like <laughs> this kind of longish like chunk of Asia, and Mongolia is like about as far from any of the coasts as you can kind of get. Right. Damn. Okay, this thing so is pretty certainly, terrestrial. It's definitely not coastal, but what seems to be the circumstances, you've got like a floodplain, like some river floodplain coming off the mountains, probably the ancestors of the Altai Mountains. That would be my guess. Mm. And then around that, you've got this barren dune sea kind of environment. Or not barren, but you know what I mean. A, a very arid in arid. environment. So you've yeah. got this range of ecosystems that's preserved over this area where you go from the Dune Sea to an intermediate area to a well-watered, a well-watered, more humid environment around the floodplain. And interestingly, around the floodplain, you start to see the same preservational biases you see in the Dinosaur Park formation. So you start to see very, very large animals preserved almost exclusively with a limited sample of small-bodied animals. That will presumably turn out to be more diverse as the area is further explored and further studied. The bias being the fossils are good. Well, the fossils are very good, but they're only of big things. So it's like, it's a lot of Sorolophus, it's a lot of Tarbosaurus, it's a lot of sauropods. Um, Baron Goyote, by the way, is where the dromaeosaurid that me and Alex described last year was from. So this is something that would have lived with Kurukula. And presumably, and uh, may have even been a prey animal of Kuru, which is kind of exciting. I would like to see my dinosaur eat this dinosaur, because this dinosaur is responsible for my phone buzzing maybe every two minutes for three days. I want to make sure that it is clear that my skepticism over the paleoecological argument is not any sort of criticism of the paper itself. It does make an argument in that case. I don't know if I believe the argument, but they make the argument and they are presenting data that are correct. Like nothing's fabricated or wrong, obviously. This isn't no, like yeah, a poorly done paper. I just don't know if I believe the line of evidence. I would like to thank the senior author of this paper for not only putting their data up on Morphosaurus, but for letting me download that data so that I can uh, do some investigation of the skull while I work on Dromaeosaurid phylogeny. So that it's is, nice I believe... This week in paleontology. It's been an exciting week. There were a lot of papers that came out that we did not have time uh, or energy 
or personal fortitude to discuss. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if we didn't get to a paper, it was because we think that the authors are fools and the paper isn't <laughs> worth our time. That concludes the first episode of the Skeleton Crew YouTube channel. We would really appreciate that if you enjoyed this video, you like and comment on it. It helps us out a lot as we grow the channel. And we'd appreciate any of the feedback that you have because this is our first time doing anything like this. And we really want to make sure that we're making the videos to the best possible quality. So anything that you think we did well, anything you think that we can improve on, we're open to all feedback. Especially if it means that we get to be a little more sassy on camera, because we will that would be great. Base ourselves for for your approval. So the things send we us will say, suggestions, anything that gets us likes. <laughs> Diving birds do an interesting thing called. F-ing. Oh, don't worry, my brother. My brother can weigh in as we talk and play Warzone. <laughs> Alex, you can't do this. You actually can't do this. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> there are a bunch of haters right now telling me I can't play the war zone. You can't play the war zone. You just can't be on the phone with your <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I just can't be on the phone because we're recording something. Okay. Hang on then. <laughs> yeah, okay. You got, you guys can Watch me. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> oh, f- I died. It's all over. Hang on. We got it. Can we include that little bit? Right, it's like a stinger. We're recording. We're recording, it. Stinger, we're recording yeah. it. I think that should be the intro. It's just like a little cut of that. No, that'll be the singer at the end. <laughs>